LegalizeFreedom.com Why are we here? Where do we come from? Where are we going? From the nature of reality to the future of humanity. Beyond politics, poverty and war. LegalizeFreedom.com Greetings and welcome once again to LegalizeFreedom.com. I'm your host Greg Moffat and my guest today is Andy Duncan who joins us to discuss the forthcoming EU referendum and various related issues. On Thursday, June 23rd, 2016, citizens of the United Kingdom will vote on whether or not to remain part of the European Union. The United Kingdom's membership of the EU was achieved in several discrete, although ultimately orchestrated stages. Since the formation of the European Economic Community in 1958, which later morphed into the European Union itself in 1993, the entire scheme has seen ever-deepening integration and interdependence between an increasing number of member countries, with the UK itself joining in 1973. Its restlessly expansive aims and ambitions were divisive then, and they remain so today, arguably more so than ever. The campaign to remain within the European Union, the imaginatively titled Remain campaign, cite reams and rafts of beneficial EU legislation which over the years has simultaneously helped protect the rights of workers, consumers, business, minorities and the environment, as well as preserving peace within Europe's borders. Their efforts, however, dubbed Project Fear by those who would quit the EU, the so-called Brexit campaign, have been marked by a distinct lack of hard facts and figures to assist the voting public in making what the Remain camp continually insist will be a momentous and strictly once-in-a-lifetime decision. As the day of reckoning draws ever closer, Remain, or Brumain if you prefer, have also indulged in blatant scaremongering with dire warnings of impending doom ranging from giant mosquito invasions to nothing less than World War III. Meanwhile, the aforementioned Brexit campaign argues that whatever the intent of the EU's founding fathers, it has metastasized into a corrupt and unaccountable cabal of control freaks and gravy train grifters. The Leave campaign have a veritable laundry list of gripes, including but by no means limited to areas such as farming, fisheries, immigration, national security, international trade and the shape of bananas. We read in the UK news just today, for example, the provocative headline, EU postpones toaster and kettle crackdown until after Brexit vote. Forget ISIS, Al-Qaeda and North Korea, surely this is the stuff of World War III. At the hands of Remain, therefore, Brexiteers are branded as ignorant, inward-looking, xenophobic little Englanders, even if they happen to live in Scotland, Wales or Northern Ireland. As things stand, however, no matter what the preferences or prejudices of individuals and institutions with an interest in the outcome, the remit, regulatory reach and sheer size of European Union bureaucracies and their combined budgets have ballooned since the nascent days of what was always a political project. Something, it would seem, simply has to give. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, maybe not even on June 23rd. But soon, and the aftermath may prove impossible to predict. Hello and welcome, Andy, and thank you so much for joining us once again on LegalizeFreedom.com. My pleasure to be here, Greg. Andy, today we're going to be discussing the forthcoming EU referendum, which is taking place here in the UK on Thursday, 23rd of June, Year of Our Lord, 2016. (laughs) What's happening here is... The, uh, the British government, the UK government, I should say, are putting it to the people in a referendum, should the UK remain in the European Union or leave? 
And this is something that's been talked about off and on probably since Britain first joined the uh, the common market way back when. But either way, if people are tuning in and there's going to be a lot of this, uh, a lot of, there already has been a lot of comments and conversation. But if people are tuning in here thinking that you and I are going to be saying we must stay in the EU or we must leave the EU. It's not black and white as far as we're concerned. And we're trying to stand off a little bit to one side of all this and just look at some of these issues from a different angle. So for the benefit of listeners, just set out your basic position here at the start. Well, I'm I'm with the Queen on this one. I uh, personally uh, want Britain to leave the EU. But there is a lot to it. It's a complicated beast. I'm not just, I'm not like a Peter Hitchens or a Peter O'Born or Nigel Farage where it's, you know, I wake up in the morning and I scream, I want to leave the EU or or like David Icke. Uh, I've got lots of reasons why I want the UK to leave the EU. But there are some good things about the EU. Maybe we can talk about some of those things too. Oh, absolutely. Again, it's, it's really not black and white. As I like to say, there's three sides to every coin. There's a face, there's a reverse and there's an edge. And um, I, I noticed, I mean, you could see it in all mainstream politics these days. I mean, it's highlighted, I think, very, uh, in very sharp relief at the minute in the US with the presidential run at the minute, isn't it? Um, I know you try not to pay attention to these things, but anyone observing that um, circus, I mean, it couldn't be more polarized. Uh, it, it's absolutely dreadful state of affairs. And uh, no doubt things will get a little bit, a little bit more subtle here, aren't they, in the UK? But things will definitely get dirtier as the, a referendum day approaches. I don't doubt it. I think it's strange, isn't it, with Donald Trump, how uh, about a year or two ago, the British government was saying, we're going to ban you from coming here, you're a mad person. And now, in my my mind, I think he's going to win the US presidential election. The British government are now kowtowing to him and say, oh, we didn't mean what we said last year. And uh, politicians, slippery people. Oh, absolutely. It's a, it's expediency, isn't it, really? It's sort of, um, you know, whatever is going to work in the moment, sort of stab someone in the back and, you know, while sort of shaking their hands, if, if that was even possible. Now, one thing that characterises the discussion and debates, whether it's amongst politicians or um, academics or the general public, you know, whether they're sort of uh, people who are paying attention to the issues regarding the EU or whether it's your you know guy down the pub just setting the world to rights, there has been a lack of coherent kind of facts and figures about the EU, the history of it, its performance, what the issues actually are, pro and against, remain and leave and what have you. And most political campaigns are like that these days. You know, it's very much about hot air, uh, more heat than light. But this has been quite spectacular. We are weeks into this campaign here in the UK, as I say, the referendum's on June 23rd, a few more weeks to go. And this is a potentially momentous decision uh, for, for a lot of people, however you look at it. And it seems that there has been so little engagement um, in actual discussion. I mean, if you and I were just sitting, if we were those two guys down the pub, we're having a discussion about this. What I actually want to know is, if I'm making a decision, is what you know, give me some numbers, actual numbers. And it, it, but even when you get into that whole area, then you realise that the numbers coming out of the EU and the numbers being offered by pro and against, you know, remain and leave camps, they're all subject to, it seems, subjective interpretation. And it makes it so, so difficult. So even when we do get facts and figures, you get someone pops up on the radio and says, here are the statistics that prove my case for remaining in the EU. Someone else comes up and says, here are my statistics that disprove yours. And then the BBC person says, ah, well, I'm sure this debate will run and run and go to, you know, run uh, end titles. And nobody's any the wiser. Well, it seems to have come down to a kind of business transaction decision, doesn't it? I'm going to be £222 a month better off because I'm outside the EU, because we're not contributing towards the EU. But George Osborne says I'm going to be £223 worse off because of mortgage things and and other related financial matters, which he's uh, got his team at the Treasury to make up. So therefore, I'm £1 a month better off inside the EU, so I'll vote to stay. And that's kind of ridiculous. But I, I think the big questions here they, people should sit back and, and grow up and stop behaving like children and ask big rational intellectual independent questions i think the big question here is do you want to be a servant of brussels do you want the uk to be um, a satrap of a, of a bigger empire or do you want britain to to have some freedom some independence if you want to be a servant of brussels vote to remain if you want to 
take the risk of uh, being an independent nation where you're in control of the government a little bit more than you are currently, then then vote to to uh, to leave uh, the EU. But I, I think this uh, lack of cohesion comes from the kind of cock up nature of this referendum in the first place. This was the referendum that was never supposed to happen. Um, this was a gambit by David Cameron before the last election. UKIP were coming up on the outside with Nigel Farage becoming the most popular man in the country, who's the leader of the UK Independence Party, trying to get out of the EU. Um, and and uh, David Cameron, the Conservative Party leader, needed to try and take some votes off him to stop the Conservative vote from crumbling. So he, gam- he made a gambit. He gambled that I will offer a referendum on the EU in order to kind of uh, put a blanket over UKIP and lo and behold, he actually went and won the election with a clear majority. Now, I think what David Cameron was expecting, he was expecting to be the prime minister again, but in a coalition government with a very small minority party like the Liberal Party. And then he was expecting the Liberals to uh, plead with him to not have the EU referendum. And then he would magnanimously agree not to have the referendum, a bit like uh, Gary Lineker. Uh, asking the BBC bosses to tell him that he can't appear in his underwear if Leicester City win the uh, the Premier League. So it all went wrong. He won. He there. He had this big promise to have to have the referendum, and he uh, uh, and I'm sure the first thing he thought the day he won the election was not great. I won the election, but oh no, what am I going to do about this referendum? So this referendum wasn't supposed to happen. Uh, this is the genie that got out of the bottle. The establishment, the, what I call the British government, which isn't the politicians, it's the kind of civil service machine which which runs the puppet politicians. They never wanted this uh, and they've been um, careering and, and running around like headless chickens trying to put this genie back in the bottle. Um, and so it's created all sorts of uh, potential situations, e- even if, and I, I think the Remain vote will win and we can come on to why I think that in a few minutes time or uh, in the next uh, few minutes. But if 40% of the people vote to leave, that 40% isn't going away anywhere soon. And they, that once you've allowed them to uh, state their opinion, that opinion isn't going away. Just like with the Scottish um, independence election, with 40-45% of the population wanting to um, become an independent country, they're not going away just because they lost this one vote. Well, quite. I mean, one thing just to throw in there is that Cameron stated quite early on Uh, not necessarily in the referendum process, but prior to that, that he didn't intend to, uh, you know, if he was re-elected as prime minister, even as part of a coalition, that he wouldn't seek another term as prime minister after that. So he already flagged this up. So that kind of plays into what you were saying about him, sort of, it would have suited him quite well to be part of another coalition. In fact, he assumed that. And you're very right also to point out about this 40%, let's say, that they voted to leave. They're not going away. All those people um, who voted for Scottish independence are still there. And the same uh, comment has been made about the US election. You know, again, very, very divisive, very nasty between uh, Trump and, and Clinton. And we've just just take the Bernie Sanders of this world out of the equation for the moment. If Trump is not elected, um, particularly particularly him, now not, you could say if, if Hillary's not elected, then the Hillary people are not going away. But the Trump contingent the trump camp is a lot more virulent if you see what i mean so if he fails to get uh the nomination or if he does get the nomination isn't elected president that is that there's a tendency there a trend that is as you, is just absolutely not going to go away in fact if anything they're going to come back again uh more determined more focused so applying that to the eu referendum thing this is uh, they, they, they like to characterize it in this country as a once in a lifetime decision in fact the official uh, British government literature uh, provided to us all um, for free, except it wasn't. It was nine. <laughs> it, it was it was nine million. Uh, it it's, likes to state this is a once in a lifetime decision in order to make people supposedly focus and think about it. But they said that about the Scottish refer- uh, you know independence referendum as well. Um, I don't think we're going to have to whatever way this referendum goes. We are not going to have to wait another another lifetime for some other uh, crisis or some other pressure for a referendum to rear its head. This uh, this talk by the Remain camp that this is a once in a lifetime opportunity, um, if if you will, is again you can just see them trying to squeeze that genie back into the bottle. They never wanted this referendum in the first place, but now they've got it. They're desperately trying to. I, I think, like I said, I, I think they will win with. 
uh, maybe 60 40 split uh, with remain getting 60 percent i think donald trump's interesting isn't he because the republican party elite are desperately trying to stop him they're trying to rig the way delegates uh, um, are voted for in the primaries and so on they're desperately trying to stop him but e- even if he doesn't become the republican candidate i'm sure he'll become an independent candidate and he's got so much money he'll be able to do that and i think he's going to win and it's uh, against the republican party elite's wishes coming back to Dave. David Cameron, how interesting is he? Because he didn't want this referendum in the first place. Now he's had it, even though he said uh, it would be a disaster to leave. I mean, what kind of a prime minister puts a choice in front of somebody saying it'll be a disaster to leave, but here you go, you can choose anyway? Very, very strange. I think the Tory party is going to split in half after this election. Either way, even if leave come out of the... uh, I don't know, come down the rail and actually win this, which I'll be amazed by, very pleased by, but amazed by. Um, Or even if they lose, David Cameron has split the Conservative Party. He's now got what I might call the Eurosceptic wing, led by Michael Gove, Boris Johnson, Steve Baker, and people like that. And then he's got his Heathite wing uh, as well. Now, strange thing about David Cameron, when he became an MP, he got his... uh, he got his seat in Parliament because he pretended to be a Eurosceptic. All along, he was a Heathite of the old kind of Edward Heath school, and that has gradually come to the fore as he's uh, risen through the ranks of power. Um, but he's always pretended to be a Eurosceptic. He's, he's just a, a shell kind of person, but he's going to split the Conservative Party. So that's going to be very, very interesting, because what will happen is the Labour Party will then walk into that vacuum as, as the Tory party breaks apart and starts fighting um, itself or fighting the other side. Uh, Jeremy Corbyn, I think, will just sit back uh, and watch this happen and then walk into Downing Street at the next general election uh, on the back of this uh, this two-headed monster fighting itself. And Jeremy Corbyn, of course, is very, very interesting. He was against the EEC in 1975. And what he said about the Maastricht Treaty is what I personally believe. I think, yes, Jeremy, with what he said in about the Maastricht Treaty, uh, he said the Maastricht Treaty takes away from parliaments the power to set policies and it hands power over to unelected bankers. He's absolutely correct. We've got to ask then, why is he in favour of the Remain campaign now? And I think it's very, very clear. He just wants to just say as little as he can get away with. Then he wants the Tory party to go into meltdown and then he's just going to win the next election as the Tory party completely collapses. So you, obviously you think that could happen, uh, but it, it, it's sort of, it's funny how the uh, pieces on the chessboard are being shuffled around at the minute, unlikely alliances, if not alliances, uh, you know, people sharing the, um, you know, the podium at press conferences, then certainly in terms of their desired outcomes, you've got people uh, on the left and right for, and people on the left and right against in terms of remain. And that's a bit, a bit like the, you know, the American political situation as well, just very strange bedfellows, you know, very strange. It'll be interesting to see when it all shakes out, That because whatever happens in the wake of this referendum, I think it's going to be, for political watchers, even if you're personally somewhat apolitical, it's going to be, it's going to be an interesting scene as the aforementioned chess pieces then jostle once more to say, OK, well, in the light of this referendum outcome, where do we go from here? Because as I said earlier, you know, this by no means is the end of the matter. You know, if it's remain in the EU, is the vote. Remember that the EU itself is in tremendous state of upheaval and flux. And for, for me, that's something that's, uh, well, the, the, of course, the Leave camp are talking about that. But I've always got one eye on that. And there's, regardless of whether we were having a referendum or not, there's enormous change of foot within the EU. You know, whether they like it or not, it's being forced on them. I think you have to be very careful when you uh, talk about the Leave campaign. I, I think in the last day or two, the Electoral Commission in the UK has said that the Leave campaign should be run by basically the Conservative Party who want to be uh, in the Leave campaign. Um, a lot of those people in that group, they don't really want to leave the EU. Boris Johnson doesn't really want to leave the EU. Michael Gove, it's very, very hard to say. Uh, there's a lot of ambition there. That's why they can sit on the same panel as somebody who's, say, a Labour 
or a left-wing Labour MP, because there's a lot of personal ambitions and uh, drives going on here. Boris Johnson wants to be the leader of the Conservative Party. He wants to be the next Conservative Prime Minister. That's, I think, the basis of his decision to say that he wants to stay in the Leave campaign. And even if the Leave campaign wins under this Conservative grouping, um, it, we won't actually leave the EU. It will just be taken by those people to the EU and saying, we've got this big vote. We've got, say, 51% of people want to leave the EU. We've had this vote. Now let's renegotiate our EU treaties. I think that would be the plan of Boris Johnson and Michael Gove. It's not to actually get out of the EU. So th this is a huge smokescreen. It's just a, a negotiating position to go to the back to the EU and say, look, we've got this piece of paper with 51% written on it, and now we're going to renegotiate and maybe get a two-speed EU with one group going down the kind of Euro, Eurozone track, and then another group going down the two-speed track, but still within the EU. Uh, I liked, uh, I think it was Peter Hitchens' phrase, he said, the EU is the Hotel California. You can check out, but you can never leave. So be very, very careful uh, looking at the people who are leading this campaign. They're not all ideologues and in it purely uh, on principle. Oh, no, far from it. I was, oddly enough, one of the few times that uh, I, um, I look at television for any length of time is, is when I find myself in a hotel on my own. And um, uh, it was I was in a hotel the morning that Boris Johnson came out and announced himself as uh, in the uh, in the leave camp. And immediately everyone, um, well, apart from the, you know, the most gullible, were just saying this is about, as you say, political ambition. So obviously you always got to read between the lines, even when the gaps between the lines are a mile wide. And uh, as you say, in, in on one level, someone like Boris Johnson can't really lose whatever, however things pan out. Because if it's um, if it's vote to remain, well, you know, it's I lost out too bad. You know, a uh, brave campaign was fought. He it can't be can't be said that he didn't actually come out and say what he said. But as you say, that's very very different from actually dealing with. Uh, you can say whatever you like, but I mean, it's if the outcome is what it is to remain, then. He, you know, it's not like it's, that was his personal decision. It's not like he's changed his mind. He's just got a new reality to deal with, so to speak. And and as you say, no one's leaving anything. So, and I'd imagine that in the in the morning, if we wake up after the uh, referendum has been has taken place, or certainly after the count has taken place, that people, apart from those very engaged uh, in the legislation so if there is any need for any new legislation and all the commentators and pundits apart from them everyone else is going to go back to what they were doing pretty quickly i would have thought yeah i, I always like joseph stalin's phrase on voting it doesn't matter how you vote what matters is who counts the votes and uh, being an anarcho-capitalist myself who thinks that the British government is nothing more than a large organised criminal gang wouldn't put it past me for them to uh, just slip a few a few hundred thousand remain votes into the ballot boxes to get the way they want. But I think they will win because the British people over the last hundred years have really become cowed. We, we, we have President Obama coming to this country and telling us, uh, for his own good, do what I say, you must stay in the EU because that's what I want. Um, reminded me very much of Negan in The Walking Dead, that kind of speech, uh, and the British people going, oh, yes, we better do what we're told. The American people, I think, are, are, are still much better off because if a British prime minister like David Cameron went to Washington and told the Americans uh, how to run their uh, country, I think it would be quite rightly put in a baggage um, uh, compartment on the next plane from Dulles Airport back to the UK. But Obama comes here and uh, just tells us what to do. It's it's quite strange how we just uh, tug our forelock and say, yes, sir, yes, sir, we'll do what you want. I think coming back as well to the to the facts of this, I, th I think the right wing and the left wing people can sit on platforms together because th th there is no kind of um, what I might call an intellectual question. Do you want to be a servant of Brussels? Do you want to be free and independent? Do you want liberty or do you want the state? Uh, those questions aren't being asked. So the left and the right can sit together. 
uh, on these panels and just talk about kind of fear mongering and giant mosquitoes invading the UK if we leave the EU and so on. But I, I think it's actually quite healthy that they're not using too many facts because it means that none of us are now believing, and not just people like you and me, but I think the general population doesn't believe anything any any politician ever says. And I think they're quite right to never believe anything they say because nearly all the time they're lying and the only time they tell the truth is by accident and then they beat themselves up over telling the truth and uh, one of the best things uh, that we saw was the Matthew Hancock interview by Andrew Neil, on, which people can find on YouTube if they want. Just type in Matthew Hancock, Andrew Neil into YouTube. You'll get this amazing interview where uh, and, uh, Michael uh, Matthew Hancock, who's a government spokesman and for the Remain campaign, was um, defending this document from the Foreign Office saying Norway, even Norway, who are outside the EU, adopt 75% of EU uh, laws. So therefore, they're not even outside the EU, so you must vote to remain. Andrew Neil uh, got some figures together and showed it's actually 9%. And he asked Matthew Hancock, where do you think the Foreign Office got this 75% figure from? When when you look at the actual underlying figures, it comes to 9%. And of course, the Foreign Office just wrote it on the back of a cigarette packet and then put it into a nice fancy document and laser printed it uh, on glossy paper, and therefore it becomes a fact. No one believes anything any politicians say any of the time, even if occasionally by accident they tell the truth. And to my mind, that's actually a good thing. Well, I mean, the, the whole presentation, I mean, what you're talking about at that relatively high level, you know, on a um, a BBC programme with a large um, listenership, uh, well, because I can't think, is there watchership, <laughs> viewership? Watchership. <laughs> watch, 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 hey, watchership. Um, I've got, so anyway, what I've got here in my hand um, is the... Just there, you can hear it physically. I've got it now. This is the leaflet that cost nine million uh, oh. to send out. Now it didn't cost nine million a pop, though. I'm sure some future government will manage to to, to manage to spend nine million pounds on it per leaflet. But the reason I'm, I'm waving this around is because we we all, everyone in the UK, every UK address should have received one of these from the UK government, uh, setting out the case. And I'm just reading from the front of it now. It says why the government believes that voting to remain in the European Union is the best decision for the UK. Uh, now, the information here is incredibly simplistic and indeed reflects more or less what's on the government's official website for the referendum, which is um, eureferendum.gov.uk. And it really is uh, pitched. Uh, I mean, put it this way, the last toaster I bought had a uh, instruction manual that was about four times as thick as this government leaflet and probably about four times as interesting as well. Certainly didn't have any lies in it. I haven't burnt any toast <laughs> or electrocuted myself or anything like that. So I have, I have every, every belief that... Um, Jewelit, by the way, uh, this show is sponsored by Jewelit, best toaster I've ever bought. Um, that's official. Um, but the the information in it is strange and the the language is very strange. And as a, a writer and editor, I pay, have to pay very close attention to... Uh, the way that slight turnabouts in phrasing, uh, how they can change emphasis and in some cases c completely change the meaning of a statement or proposition. And in this government leaflet and indeed on the website, there's a lot of, uh, and it reminds me of this whole fear mongering from both camps, but there's a lot of, they'll have a, 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 a headline proposition saying, if we leave, if uh, the UK leaves the EU, uh, the following might happen. OK, you read the headline, oh, you, then go into, yeah, you then go into the text and it says, da, 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 this would happen. Now, I'm like, hang on a minute. And then thereafter, in the second paragraph, it has both of them. This might happen. This would happen. And I'm kind of, well, which is it? You know what I mean? Now, if you had that in court, it would just be thrown out immediately. It's just to say, you've got to come back. This is no good. This is meaningless. Which is it? But the government see fit to say this might happen. This would happen. You know, and it's there's a lot of if there's a proposition A might happen, then you can't say that proposition B would happen. You have to say that it would happen only if proposition A does happen, not might. You see what I mean? I don't want to tie people up in semantics here, but I, I look at this stuff and a lot of it is very, very fuzzy. And this leaflet is not designed for people who are really looking in depth into these issues. You know, that serious analysts are not going to get their information about the referendum from this leaflet. 
Yes, uh, I object, of course, to HMRC regularly sending me threatening letters with menaces demanding that I give them tax and then taking that money and then producing such uh, documents which are just full of lies and things made up on the back of cigarette packets um, and then sent to me for me to believe their indoctrination. I, I think this also betrays the kind of elitist um, uh, uh, thinking in the British government and, and most states, of course, but th this might bring us on to the structure of the EU in the first place. I think there are some good things in the EU uh, because it comes out of two traditions. The EU comes out of a, uh, an elitist, statist, kind of socialist kind of a thrust uh, over the last hundred years. But the other thrust to it is the kind of old European classical liberal thrust as well, um, as exemplified by Ludwig von Mises, uh, which gives us the free markets, which gives us... Um, you know, solid economic bases for things uh, and uh, a solid legal system. And then we have the, the elitist statist thrust as well. You put these two thrusts together and you end up with the EU. Now, it has gone too far down the, the elitist statist kind of road where they talk down to us like we're kindergarten children. And, well, they, they think we're too stupid to, to rule our own lives anyway and that there, there must be an elite to direct us in the correct path which will be good for us. It just so happens to be extremely good for them with their salaries and pensions and expenses and career opportunities. But that's by the by. They're, they're angels and uh, we're just a hoi polloi of mass of people who, who need to be told what to do. And this document probably reveals that. But we shouldn't completely dismiss the EU. Uh, for instance, the EU does have this, uh, from the classical liberal tradition of Europe, it does give us these spurious but occasional protections. So, for instance, the UK police have tried to massively extend the DNA database and the EU uh, court legal system threw that out and stopped them doing that. It, uh, it gives us these rights which stops the, the, um, the kind of very aggressive British ruling elite um, the ability to completely uh, take us apart. So there, there are some good things about the EU, it, it, but the, nobody knows the future. When they say this would happen, who are they? Are these people time lords? Uh, have they been to the future? Do they know what the future holds? This is why it has to come back to what I might call ideological or intellectual questions about, you know, just positions. Do, do I want to be free or do I want to be part of a status collective. It, we, we can't know what the future is. Uh, one bad thing that could come out of the, a Brexit, I mean, this is one thing that I foresee happening. We we have the Leave campaign. Uh, somehow we get Boris Johnson, Michael Gove and the rest of the Conservative Party to actually not have the five, ten year ne renegotiation, but actually to leave the EU. Goodness gracious. Britain is then, say, completely free. And to me, that would be great. I believe in secession worldwide. I think we should all secede, to secede down to the individual. But the British state will still be in existence and it will feel itself alone. It won't have its empire anymore. It won't be part of the EU empire. It might fall into the hands of the American empire even more strongly. We could literally become the 51st state. We could even join, you know, NAFTA or, or something like that and join Canada, the US and Mexico in NAFTA. Um, that's a bad thing, I think. That could happen. Uh, maybe we won't do that. Maybe we'll just become like a big Hong Kong or a big Singapore and become a free trading nation um, and, and dominate the world through services and uh, all sorts of amazing things. That's what I hope will happen. That's what I think might happen. But nobody knows the future. And for these people to tell us that they know the future and what would happen, I think is disgraceful. Yeah, well, the aforementioned government leaflet and website uh, appeal, as you might expect, it's, uh, it's aimed at the public. So they're, they're appealing to the lowest common denominator and they're trying to boil it down to things that um, Joe public can identify with. So say for the sake of argument, they say that you'd be £220 per family per year worse off and it's always hard working families god forbid that there be families who like a lot of leisure or people who are not don't have families i don't i'm not sure about them uh, but it seems that the only thing that exists is hard working families so 220 pounds i don't know is equivalent to 50 pints of newcastle brown ale and, and, <laughs> and suddenly it's like oh shit it's 50 pints of beer you know and then suddenly it becomes a real issue and uh, the guy's putting on his duffel coat and his hobnail boots to rush down to the um to the to the voting booth or however it's going to be done i don't even know the mechanism of this yet i've not uh, taken sufficient interest in it from that point of view but um 
to address the idea of what is good about the the EU, potentially past, present, future, one thing that that I get when I speak to people that I know, and uh, many of them are uh, you know good people, and it, it, by and large, I would say most of the people I know want to remain within the EU. Now, not that many of them have necessarily done a lot of statistical analysis, but, you know, they, they look at the political scene and, you know, domestically and internationally up to a point. And they quite often cite things like uh, the European Bill of Human Rights, which and which has actually got, is actually separate from the EU, if you actually look at it, you know, in terms of institutions. And the, the argument that could be made either way is, well, the good things that flow from the EU and by extension from EU membership are not somehow unique to the EU as an institution. That is to say that this is the idea that Christians think that the Ten Commandments, uh, you know, are supposed to be virtuous, but therefore that unless you subscribe to the Ten Commandments, that you cannot be a good and virtuous person. You know, you can be an atheist, a humanist, um, or any other denomination of religion other than Christian and still subscribe to Christian ideals of, you know, humanity to your fellow man and all the rest of it, you know, do unto others, etc. That's not uniquely Christian. But a lot of people now feel, uh, especially those of us of a certain generation, have grown up only knowing the European Union. And as you mentioned earlier, seeing it as a restraining bolt on some of the excesses of various governments over the years. So, it's a, it's a difficult balance to strike because you can, you can argue either way. You can say this, this good bit of EU legislation, we could do that anyway. You know, an independent uh, UK could just enact whatever, you know, in any event. And the bad thing coming from the EU, uh, equally, a uh, independent and some other governments around the world, you know, an independent UK could bring in all sorts of legislation that, would, that, that people, business people or whatever would think was a nightmare. Yeah, there's all sorts. Again, it comes from these two traditions: the uh, the European classical liberal tradition and the the European elitist statist tradition. Unfortunately, though, I think the statist tradition is winning. Uh, we see this kind of growth of this bureaucracy. We we see tens of thousands of people in Brussels on very very handsome salaries, massive corruption, uh, uh, corporate. Uh, entities just if they want something done they just go to brussels they talk to somebody they uh, hand them a campaign contribution let's call it that and then that uh, law is then enacted to do whatever the big corporation wants so the the increasing elitism statism uh, uh, corruption of the eu will grow i think i, I think the classical liberal tradition uh, is shrinking uh, for various reasons and so that's why i think we need to get away from this monster um, before it gets out of control and just becomes another Soviet Union. I think it'll take a long time to do that. Lots of the people in Europe, of course, uh, the EU regulations are handed down from the EU and most countries just completely ignore them. Britain's very, very strange because its government um, gold plates all the regulations and uh, imposes them with zeal, which is very, very strange. Uh, we, we can be independent. Uh, the Britain has been independent for, you know, for 2,000 years um, since the Roman Empire collapsed. Uh, different countries, England, Scotland, Wales and so on, have been independent for a long time. We were independent until 1975. Unfortunately, I'm still old enough to remember that election. Uh, Margaret Thatcher wearing a jumper with all the flags of uh, Europe on it. And uh, I haven't grown up with the EU. I grew up with the EEC. It was all, we were slept walked into this. It was supposed to be a European economic community. It wasn't supposed to become a country, but like uh, frogs in slowly heating water, we've been, we're, we're reaching boiling point now. And uh, I think it's time to get out. I think the EU it, itself, of course, is... Um, there is another good thing about the EU, and that's the euro. Now, that might come, sound very strange coming from a believer in Austrian economics like me, but it has some good features. And this is why Herto, uh, Jesus Herto de Soto is such a big fan of the euro, because it's almost like a kind of gold money. It's, it's a single money, and that makes business transactions uh, much easier, much simpler to transact if you're in Luxembourg and you're doing business with somebody in Belgium and they're doing some business with somebody in France and they're doing business with somebody in Germany all within 50 miles of each other. Having this single currency is a great thing. And we used to have a single currency throughout Europe and that was gold and that was a great currency. Now, the problem, of course, with the uh, with the euro is coming back again to uh, Jeremy Corbyn's point about the Maastricht Treaty, uh, 
It takes away power from national parliaments and hands it to an unelected set of bankers. The euro isn't gold. It can be printed infinitely by the ECB, and it is being printed infinitely by the ECB to impose socialism via the socialism of money control. Um, what was supposed to be the super Deutschmark is becoming the super lira or the super drachma. And uh, I, I think these these things will all come together. I think the euro, as it collapses, uh, as it faces its own implosion, is going to, even if we stay inside the EU, I think the EU will implode anyway because of this euro, uh, because this is a paper currency. It's being printed to infinity and it's going to cause economic stagnation. We're going to enter, if we're lucky, we're going to enter a, a few lost decades like they've had in Japan in the earlier Keynesian experiment in money printing. Um, uh, but at worst, because Japan's one nation with one kind of nationhood and one identity because we have so many identities. We've got the Greeks against the Germans. We've got the Spaniards against uh, the French. We've got the Germans and the British, the Danish uh, against the, I don't know, the, the Italians. We've got all these different cultural um, identities and then you add in stagnation for 10, 20 years, and the whole thing's going to implode anyway. It's interesting you should mention the euro at this juncture, actually, because it's one of the few things you notice when you're listening to the current debate about the UK referendum in the UK media, that one of the few concessions that the uh, pro-EU, you know, the Remain camp make is that the euro itself has been a disaster not all of them by any means of course but i've heard a few voices saying yes it has you know they've used the word disaster actually without saying how they think that, what the future might look like um but they, they've been prepared to go that far and i think it's interesting that another part of that uh, booklet i mentioned earlier the nine million quid uh, special uh, that the government sent out there's a curious little section in it uh, in which the government brag about the concessions that they've managed to wring out of the EU, the so-called special status, which is a little bit strange in itself, don't you think? Because, you know, we're there. this is the pro-EU uh, camp within, you know, the UK political establishment, the Remain crowd. And yet they're saying that uh, they're talking about a reformed EU. And let's not forget that reform is neither positive nor negative. It just means to reform something, just to change it. I think it's become conflated, you know, just with... Uh, unalloyed positivity and the best of both worlds is the actual phrase that they use in the uh, in this official literature well why doesn't everyone else want the best of both worlds you know what why are we in britain so blessed to get the best of both, both worlds and one of the things just to draw my point to a close one of the things in the bullet points in this best of both worlds sections is saying we will not join the euro that's one of, that's in fact that's the first one on the list I think the four countries which have the best of both worlds, of course, are the uh, are the four members of the EEA, the European Economic Area. That's Iceland, Norway, Switzerland, and Liechtenstein. They uh, they trade within the EU. They they have no tariffs. They have no trade barriers. But they're outside the EU. I think that's the best of both worlds. If if you want to give a best of both worlds argument, you say let's let's uh, let's become like Norway. Let's become like Switzerland. You've got Switzerland completely surrounded by the EU. Uh, if the, I think the Remain people would would want Switzerland and Norway and Iceland to just disappear off the map for three or four months because they're glaring examples that you do not need to be in the EU to survive in Europe economically. Switzerland does OK. Norway does OK. Iceland had a terrible time in 2008, but it's coming back strongly. And, of course, Liechtenstein has a great time because uh, it, uh, it, it's, uh, it's in the EEA and it's... Uh, gets lots of business from all over the place, not in the EU, but in the EEA. If that was offered to me now, I'd, I think I could possibly accept that. I'd, that would be where I think we'll probably be in maybe five, ten years' time if uh, we win the Leave campaign and if Boris Johnson and uh, Michael Gove and so on can actually be persuaded to actually leave the EU and not just use it as a renegotiation um, stratagem. Um, let's just go for EEA status, just like Norway, just like Switzerland, just like Iceland, just like Liechtenstein. Well, of course, Norway and Switzerland have, uh, have been particularly much talked about so far in the campaign, uh, you know, by both sides, as you say, held up as exemplars of what uh, could be achieved. And of course, the, you know, the Romanian camp have said, well, actually, they are tied to, they be, what they basically tried to say is they're, they're, they're tied to a lot of the rules, but they don't have the access to kind of make the rules. But 
my way of looking at it, has it having been to both Norway and Switzerland a number of times, is that I'm guessing that these are small, uh, single-minded, quite focused countries, and they probably wouldn't be sticking with it if it wasn't working for them. Yeah, and I think they've got independent people as well. And I, I wish that was uh, what we would have again in Britain like we used to have uh, pre-1913 before the state grew massively after World War One or through World War One, and then grew massively again in um, World War Two. Going back to 1913 in the UK, the, the only kind of time a normal person would ever touch the state is if they went to a post office and bought a stamp with the, uh, the king's head on it. Um, that was as close to the state as most people ever came. Much, much, much lower taxes, much, much, much smaller state. And I think that independent-mindedness is still evident in Switzerland. It's still evident in Norway, still evident, of course, in Iceland. And there's other parts of Europe which aren't in the EU. We've got the Channel Islands, we've got the Isle of Man, we've got, uh, I'm not sure about Andorra, but Andorra's probably not inside the EU. All these places amazingly managed to survive despite being uh, completely surrounded by the EU. And even in Andorra, I don't think they even have their own currency. I think they just use the euro. They'll, I think in Andorra, they'll use whatever money uh, you, you can give them for whatever they're selling to you. So we do not need to be inside the EU uh, to survive in the modern world. And um, I, if people would just acknowledge that, then we can possibly move on. Well, I mean, I, I was... Um in a coffee shop just today and uh, some Americans came in and uh, they, were, they were very pleasant uh, but they had it explained to them they were obviously going around Europe and they had it explained to them that um, although they knew that, that, that sterling was the currency here in the UK they had it explained to them that they couldn't in fact spend euros in the cafe now this was one of the, the you know chain cafes so it wasn't like a independent mom and pop place where they could just say oh yeah we'll take your euros I mean, you go to Morocco um, and, and trying to buy a carpet or something. Once you're done haggling, they'll take ways well, like what you got, euros, dollars, you know, gold, silver. If it's something that they recognize that they know they can use, they'll take it. And I've I've run stalls before events, you know, and, and but foreigners have ruled up. This is back pre uh, euro, actually. Guys have come up with Deutschmarks and, uh, you know, uh, lira and stuff. And I've just crunched the numbers and, you know, just made sure that I accounted for my uh, transaction costs. And I said, yeah, I guess that's good. I'll take it. You know, other people are kind of turning their nose up at it. And uh, this brings us back to the question of, you know, like, what is money? And, you know, it's like, this is why, you know, for so long, the US dollar and, and still is actually, you know, accepted around the world by all sorts of people and, and not just in, you know, criminal or underworld organizations, just in practical day-to-day -day situations where there's a bit of instability or a bit of flux, you know, with regard to the currency situation. I know I uh, go to Turkey once a year and um, I just take euros with me because when you offer the taxi drivers um, uh, the Turkish lira, they, they, they give you a funny look because they know that you've got euros on you somewhere and that they kind of would rather have the euros. Coming back to David Cameron, of course, um, what what a strange negotiation strategy. As I said earlier, he, he became a Conservative MP under the cloak of being a Eurosceptic, but all along he was a, a Heathite elitist. And uh, he goes to Europe with this kind of, he announces beforehand he's going to win these magnificent concessions and then he's going to come back like Chamberlain holding up a piece of paper in 1938 saying, I have beaten the uh, Europeans at their own game. And of course they gave him absolutely nothing. Maybe some extremely complicated short-term welfare measure rules. Dropped a lot of things he said he would try and get, just completely blanked those. Got really basically absolutely nothing. But then if you go into a negotiation saying, I want to join or stay in your party, let's have a negotiation. What are you going to do with him? You're just going to laugh at him. They laughed at him. He came back. We laughed at him again. Um, it's amazing, really, that people are voting for these uh, Remain people. I mean, David Cameron, George Osborne, William Hague, Tony Blair... These are people who are just liars. They are snake oil salespeople. You wouldn't buy a used car from any of these people, particularly William Hague, who I, I, I don't know if he's ever told the truth in the last 20 years. Uh, I don't know that if the truth ever finds its way past his lips. We've got Tony Blair, of course, pro-EU. Just because these people are all pro the EU, that would make me, if I wasn't really thinking about this, want to vote the other way. So... Very, very strange that so many people are now believing these people when, quite rightly, beforehand, they would never believe a word any of these people said. Now, um, one question that people 
uh, sometimes ask uh, when they're when they're thinking about the UK situation is, you know, has any other uh, EU country ever actually left? And from what I can glean, the answer to that is no. The closest you'll find is uh, in 1985. Uh, according to my information, or 1982, if you believe the BBC, somebody's got the research wrong. It's either me or the BBC. Let's go with 1985. Uh, Greenland, which had been kind of sucked into the uh, EU kind of Death Star uh, tra- <laughs> tra- tractor beam, <laughs> if you know what I mean, because uh, it was part of it was part of a it was De- Denmark, a, isn't that, it? That's correct. Yeah. Uh, and so the, the uh, Greenland um, kind of opted out at that stage. But then again, it wasn't really, I mean, a lot of people won't even have been aware Greenland ever came under the influence of the EU, but that's about as close as you can get. But beyond that, again, according to my best information, um, something like a Brexit or British exit has not occurred. It's very strange, isn't it? You've got Denmark. If you look, if you look at a globe, Denmark's the size of a, a thumb and Greenland's the size of a grizzly bear. And yet... Uh, Denmark controls Green, uh, Greenland. I think this, the closest to this I maybe is the Americans. Now, at the risk of offending all, some of your American listeners and at the risk of completely getting all of my history wrong, uh, the US was a, was a British colony or 13 British colonies, and then it seceded from the British Empire. So that's a secession that actually happened. Uh, and then it was written into the American Constitution, I think. Again, your American listeners will, will uh, no doubt be jumping up and down if I get this wrong. It's sort of written into the U.S. Constitution that any of the 13 colonies can secede from the United States with a, in, in the plural. And it was always assumed that they could do that. But if you leave it long enough, as the Americans in the uh, Southern Confederated States found out, when they, and we can, let's just blank and skip the reasons why they wanted to do this, when those states wanted to secede from the United States empire, they were prevented, um, and they, there was a bitter a war, uh, what the Austrians in Alabama, Auburn, Alabama, called the War of Northern Aggression, um, a bitter war to prevent them leaving. And maybe that's where the EU might be slipping. There's always this, yes, you can leave from the Hotel California. You can never check out, but you can attempt to leave. But eventually it becomes more of a prison than a hotel. And you can't leave, and it's impossible to leave. Now, I think the um, EU is going to collapse anyway because it's growing to become a Soviet monster. Uh, and as you, uh, it's becoming an island of, of socialism. And as socialism increases, of course, it introduces bigger and bigger islands of chaos where people are demotivated, where you can't calculate things. And as these islands of chaos grow within an ever-increasing socialist empire, you get the seeds of the collapse coming from the inside anyway, and then the whole thing falls apart. Now, how it falls apart is the obviously the important part. You want it to fall apart peacefully. You don't want it to fall apart in, in an aggressive, horrible, civil war style. So maybe some of the people who are thinking remain or leave should think, if we don't get out now we won't be able or allowed to get out in, say, 15, 20 years' time. There'll, there'll be prison bars on the walls of the Hotel California rather than curtains. And if you can't get out, then anything that must stop will stop eventually and Britain will leave, but it might take some kind of um, conflict, armed conflict, to do it. So maybe people should think about those kinds of questions as well. We need to leave now because maybe in 20 years' time we won't be able to without adopting serious um, military uh, matters. And I do not want to go there whatsoever. Do you know, um, I've been <clears throat> listening to what you were saying there. I've got lost in a little reverie about Hotel California, the song. I've been re- <laughs> I started to rewrite it in my head and I was thinking that the, 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 um, the Brexit camp should have had an anthem by now. They should have released it and made it the soundtrack to a promotional video, perhaps. And I was trying to think of what European capital or what European centre of, of EU bureaucracy is there that we could insert instead of California that would actually work. So I'm going to have to think about that. Not too much of a think because we don't have, you know, there's not enough time to write a song and get it recorded and released. But um, anyway, that's what I've been doing with my brain while you were, <laughs> you were being sensible. Well, fantastic. Uh, 
I, I think that you just kind of made me think about the Brexit campaign itself, hasn't it? Being terrible. I mean, who's the leader? Uh, the, 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 the Conservative Leave group, whatever they're called, uh, have been appointed by the British state, the Electoral Commission, uh, another another part of the organised criminal mafia that is the British state, to, to, to lead the campaign. And who's leading that campaign? Is it Boris Johnson? Is it Michael Gove? Where's Nigel Farage? Um it should obviously, to my mind, have been Nigel Farage. Uh, he's, you know, he's made a career for the last ten years about being Mister Beer Pint Drinker, Mister Popular. He's a focal point. He would say what you like about him, whether you love him or loathe him. At least he can string a coherent, uh, a coherent sentence together, like me in the last sentence. So where, where's the leaders? It should have been Nigel Farage as the leader. People should have got behind him. There should have been a single message. But we've got this kind of hydra, this many-headed beast. We don't, we don't even know who's leading the um, the campaign. Now, if it can't be Nigel Farage, then I wanted to be Steve Baker MP, uh, MP for, for High Wycombe. Uh, he, I think he's a, from the classical liberal tradition. He's a genuine person who has genuine principles. He can speak well. He's not in it for his ambition. He's not in it for his career. Uh, he can speak to ordinary working, hard, sorry, hard working families, yeah. but he can also speak to other normal, ordinary people as well. I think he should be the leader, uh, if it can't be Nigel Farage, not Boris Johnson or Michael Gove. And these are the careerists uh, who are going to squabble over the next few weeks to work out who is the leader. Uh, and they'll probably take it in turns with the Labour Party people as well, who are also career careerist ambition people. And the whole thing will be a giant mess. Uh, and then people will be left with nothing but just what they see on the BBC. Of course, if you uh, if you ever go to the BBC as a staffer, when you come out of Cambridge and Oxford or Bristol University, uh, they hand you a leaflet, uh, a dictionary of terms, and um, under madness, madness is defined as not loving the EU. And if you cut anybody from the BBC in half, like a piece of Blackpool rock, it says EU in the middle. So people watch the BBC news... Totally pro EU, even if it's fifty percent um, of the time is devoted to the to the Leave campaign. It's uh, they bring on all the usual strange mad people with tinfoil hats on, and on the Remain side we have the Prime Minister, we have Gordon Brown, we have Statesman, we have Obama on the other side. So they're totally, totally pro EU, just like all the the rest of the elite who think the rest of us are too stupid to run our own lives. Got to think as well about a lot of these universities and charities coming out in support of the EU. A lot of this EU money that we uh, that we hand over every day, it's not actually going to the EU. It actually, gets it comes back via a back door. So lots of these NGOs, universities, charities, etc., they get massive grants from the EU. So again, it's the elite funding the elite to do what the elite wants to do all day: sit in nice little offices. Have nice cups of coffee, do a lecture at ten, go home at three o'clock in the afternoon, take Fridays off. That was my university anyway. I don't know about your university if if you went to one. Um, so they've got this whole elitist thing. Uh, all the elite want to stay in the EU. The the Brexit campaign is a complete and total shambles. It, it should be coherent and uh, led under a unified leader, but it's not going to be. Um, people are then left with nothing to go on but their emotions. That will um, try to be controlled by people like the BBC, who are extremely pro-EU, and people on the voting day won't really know what to do. So they'll either not vote at all because they just don't know what to do, and they, they, they haven't been intellectually correctly led by anybody, or if they do end up in the voting booth, they'll just say remain, because once people are in a certain position, the, the two biggest fears in life are risk and change, and people will kind of say, well, it's not too bad now. I might lose my job if we leave. It's, I've got a job now. I'll just vote to remain. Just go with the status quo. So the Brexit campaign, absolute shambles, should get itself together as fast as possible. It should be Nigel Farage leading it or it should be Steve Baker. Or if it, if it must be Boris Johnson or Gove, pick one and stick to that person and th let them be the focal point. But they're not going to do it because... Like I said earlier, I don't think Boris Johnson and Michael Gove actually really want to leave the EU. They just want to use a leave vote as a uh, as a staging post towards an EU renegotiation. And even if Remain wins, and they won't be too desperately upset about that, I don't think, they'll then use it as a platform to uh, make their bid for leadership of the Conservative Party. Uh, well, I mean, certainly neither Gove nor uh, Boris Johnson come across in anything I've ever seen them say or do 
or even their gait as classical, you know, champions of, of uh, liberty and, and, and freedom. Uh, and as far as go goes, I mean, this is a personal bit of mudslinging here, but I mean, would you trust a guy that um, doesn't sleep in the same bedroom as his wife? And, uh, and, and this said wife, if, if indeed she is a woman, uh, says that the secret to happy marriage is to not uh, sleep in the same room. But, you know, I say personal mudslinging aside. Uh, by the way, Steve Baker, is that the, the monetary reform MP? Absolutely, to do with the Cobden Centre. That's right. Yeah, and you had heard his name somewhere. But as far as Farage goes, again, and let's, uh, I'm just speaking personally here, Andy. Um, I am not uh, signed up for this either way. Um, I'm no supporter of any political party uh, or any individual politician. Farage does come across better in the media than a lot of people do. Uh, I mean, David Cameron, for example, you can present very well and you can be very slick. What I, when I say come across well, what I mean is uh, speak uh, clearly and obviously, you know, off the cuff or from the heart. On, and it doesn't mean they never make mistakes. But where I'm going with this is that for a lot of people, um, that, that you know, that I know that would move in my circle. Uh, they're just alarmed by Farage because, as far as they're concerned, he's at the very least a bit xenophobic. Xenophobic, even though he's what you know got French lineage or whatever. Um, and at worst, he's a racist. You know, it's not BNP, but it's in the same spectrum. If you say what I mean. So for someone like Farage, it's such a divisive figure. Really, um, I'm not sure how it would have worked. Really, if he had. Um, however well he articulated the arguments, I'm, I'm not sure how that would have panned out if he if he had somehow become the, you know, the head of of any sort of leave campaign. Well, I think they just do need to pick some kind of leader, don't they? They need to pick somebody who's going to be the focal point. Now, I, I don't particularly care who it is. Almost, uh, I think it's a kind of a military phrase, isn't it? Um, just make a decision now to, as to who should be the leader, rather than the perfect decision after the event. Uh, Boris Johnson would do. Let, let's just make it him. But with this committee of, of, of 10 worthy people, it, I mean, I believe usually in the cock-up uh, the cock -up theory of history where things like this referendum election are just all mighty cock-ups. But if I was uh, into the conspiracy theory um, kind of way of thinking, I would have a conspiracy that the Conservative Party ambitionists like Johnson and Gove have wanted Brexit to be the campaign to be a complete shambles so that the Remain campaign wins, so that they can have this kind of background of I did the right thing, I did the right Eurosceptic thing, but we're still in the EU and we'll just have to work with it uh, because that's what the British people want. That would be my conspiracy theory um, on this one. Just to address a point you made a few moments ago regarding uncertainty, and this is one of the main uh, flags that is run up uh, by the Remain camp. That is to say, you know, if we were to, if the UK was to leave the EU, there would be years, possibly decades of uncertainty. Uh, there would be immediate effects, but it'd be medium term effects, long term effects. We have no idea what they could be. Um, you know, it's, it's jumping into an abyss. Uh, my answer to that would be that as if uh, we have business as usual, let's imagine that this referendum was never even called as if going forward as part of the EU, there is anything other than uncertainty staring us in the face. Yeah, there are certain things that would, would remain more or less in place, which would be thrown out if we left the EU. But as I mentioned earlier, this whole situ EU situation is in a tremendous state of flux. So we are by no means can have certain futures, you know, stable uh, the idea of uh, prosperity for ourselves, you know, our, our family, our, you know, our, our careers, uh, companies, we, you know, uh, in terms of investment, uh, in terms of security, the international situation. There's nothing. The world is an uncertain place. So I just think it's a little bit disingenuous, really, to just say that, well, you know, if we were to leave, uh, you know, all bets are off. You know, all the pieces are thrown in the air. If we stay, better the devil, you know. Well, this is the Time Lord thing again, isn't it? Where the elites see themselves as Time Lords who know everything, they're omniscient, omnipotent and so on. But we are living, as the Chinese used to say, in very, very interesting times. We're still not out of the 2007 uh, financial crisis. People think that's gone away. Well, some people think it's gone away, but of course that hasn't even gone away. That's just been papered over by massive money printing all over the world by central banks all tied together by the Bank of International Settlements. Strangely enough, 
uh, based in Switzerland. Oh, that just reminds me, of course, the EU in some ways almost becomes kind of irrelevant because lots of the regulations it hands down anyway aren't of its own making. They're just handed down to it by Bank of International Settlements. Um, uh, uh, tariffs and so on are handed down to it by the um, the World Trade Organization. So there are many of these kind of quasi, totally hidden away um, uh, organizations like that which hand their rules to the EU and then the EU hands them to the British government and then the British government hands them to the local authorities and then the local authorities hand them to the city councils and then the city councils, four or five layers of government here, hand them down and um, impose them on the rest of us. So the EU in some ways almost becomes irrelevant. And, and again, yes, we're in a massive state of flux. We've got who knows what going on in the US with, I think, Donald Trump becoming president. Now, that's going to shake up a few uh, a few chickens in the, in the hen house. Then we've got Putin in the, um, uh, in the old Soviet Union, I was going to say, in Russia. We've got who knows what's going on in the Ukraine. Um, we've got who knows what's going on in Syria with... Who knows which organisations fermenting things there? We've got the migration crisis. Who created that? Who's let down these border posts? Who's let all these people in? That then creates huge amounts of emotion, um, which people go into voting booths and votes purely on emotion, which is, I think, the wrong thing to do about a migration crisis. We've got uh, we've got the rise of China. Uh, but then it's following a Keynesian path, and Keynesianism always leads to collapse in the end. I think China will keep rising, but it will go through little dips, and maybe we'll have a little dip, and then a Chinese little dip will be a huge dip for the rest of us. Uh, we've got Japan's been in a in a kind of a stagnant bubble world for 30 years and still doesn't look to be getting out of that because it still believes in Keynesianism. Who can know the future? Uh, I could I could give you a hundred different paths of what the future might be. Uh, might go like. I think a lot of my predictions would be based on the collapse of paper money, but other people out there can come up with their own predictions. I think voting for the Remain vote, which I think a lot of people will do, is because the next day things will be the same, and I think people feel comfortable and happy with that because they're cowed and they've suffered decades of state propaganda saying how marvellous the state is. But, you know, if the euro collapsed, um, if Greece defaults on its loans again, if there's a serious migration problem in Germany, um, if, you know, Putin does something which is exploited by America in the Ukraine, uh, who knows what the future is? And again, I think it's uh, disingenuous of these people to claim that they do know. They don't know, and neither do I. Well, you touched upon the, the Middle East there. And just to throw in a, a brief point about security, of course, that's another thing that's held over our heads and it's very much in people's minds these days because of what's happening in the Middle East and elsewhere. I mean, it's a global situation, really. You know, the threat is real and constant. And that's another thing that was wheeled out very much that if we were to leave the EU that um, you mentioned the giant, uh, was it locusts? Or it wasn't locusts, was it? it was, mosquitoes. Um, mosquitoes. Uh, well, perhaps ISIS will mount some dirty bombs on the underside of these mosquitoes and they will fly over Britain and uh, they will be uh, like, the, it'll be a blitz all over again, only a blitz of, you know, jihadis and, and mosquitoes. Um, I can envision that would make, certainly make a good front page for the Daily Star. Do you think that the secure, I mean, are we in a better position security wise um, being in a, a Norway, Switzerland type position when it comes to that? I mean, is there, are they, as far as your observations or knowledge are concerned, do they feel compromised security wise by being, uh, you know, how can I put it, in a number of agreements with the EU? Well, you've got to remember, of course, I do come up from a position where the state is, is a mafia criminal gang. But I'll just put my statist head on for a moment and believe in government and believe in the British government. Who does MI6 have its biggest relationships with? It has its biggest relationships with the CIA and uh, uh, the kind of national security agency in the United States. Um, is the NSA and the CIA and America in the EU? No. Does that stop MI6 having relations with it? No, they have very, very close and intimate relations. GCHQ, MI6, MI5, NSA, CIA, it's almost one organisation. British Army, who does it have its biggest relationships with? US Army, well, where does most British Army equipment come from? Does it come from the EU? No, it comes from America. Uh, British soldiers train and work with US Army people. That's happened in Afghanistan. 
You know, where where was the French army in Afghanistan? Where was the German army in Iraq? Where was the Spanish army in um, in Syria uh, and Libya and all these places? The British state security machine is completely enmeshed with the United States security machine. It has nothing to do with the EU. Um, uh, will Britain, let's say it has relations with the French secret intelligence services and people, are they just going to throw those away because we're not in the EU anymore? No, just like they are not going to throw away the CIA relationship because America isn't in the EU. All these security organisations, all these state organisations are talking out of their derrieres. They're not just going to stop talking to all these other people. They're not going to stop talking to Mossad. They're not going to stop talking to the Australian Secret Service, whoever they are. This is just smoke and wind. This is the referendum that should never have happened. And, and also, of course, will we have more secure borders if we're just one country? Of course we will. If we do vote to stay in the Remain camp, one potential future out of a myriad of other potential futures is the eu then says right you voted to stay in now now the kind of the gloves come off and then they impose things on us and they impose 400 500 600 thousand um, migrants with 20 30 thousand isis supporters embedded uh, within those migrants if we're independent we can say no we're not taking these people not without our checks so we'll let in genuine migrants and we'll sift out those six foot two well muscled young men um, who don't appear to be in any kind of distress. So we're not going to take orders from the EU. Our borders will be more secure if we're independent, not less secure. Um, so again, I think this is another species argument of the uh, of the states. It's all they want is they just want a nice big empire. Uh, I, I see the British government as being like the Sopranos mafia gang ruling New Jersey and the UK as New Jersey. And the EU as being the, the five families in New York mafia. At the moment, there's a link between the Sopranos gang and the, the five families gang in New York. Um, if you break the link, the Sopranos gang does become weaker, but it doesn't make us less secure. It just means the Sopranos gang is weaker. They want a strong centralizing state. It gives them the excuses they need to bring in all of their regulations they want to impose on us. So the British government imposes some terrible, stupid regulation on us. And then it says, oh, we had nothing to do with this. This was imposed on us by the EU. They want to be part of the Brit the bigger um, EU empire. They 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 don't want to be us to be smaller. They can't drive around in such big cars and have such big swanky offices and pay themselves so much if they're ruling a smaller entity. Um, we'll be more secure if we're outside the EU, not less secure. Well, personally, I think like it or not, when it comes to whether it's business or whether it's security, whatever the big issue happens to be, money talks and bullshit walks. Um, when James Bond was deep behind... Uh, Eastern Bloc lines back in his heyday. Did he have any problem getting Stolichnia and Beluga Caviar? <laughs> no, he didn't. You know, so money talks and bullshit walks. And I think when it comes down to it, it's pragmatism. And I think that's what rules the day, no matter what the politicians say. And I think that's what would ultimately rule the day. Uh, and again, I'm, I'm kind of trying to just stand back here and look at this and, and give my opinion. I'm not saying that's what, you know, I, I haven't got any evidence for X, Y and Z, how things are going to pan out. But that's if, I'm just looking at history, really. You know, how have things tended to work when left to their own devices or even when maximum interference has been taking place? You know, like it's like holding the beach ball um, underneath the water eventually when it's let go what happens then it comes to the surface and what was going to take place takes place anyway yeah what if something must stop it will stop it's just a question of how it will stop will it be a like an earthquake you know the the the, the, the earth plates want to move there's two ways they can move they can move very very gradually like they do in some parts of the Atlantic where you get little bits of new crust popping up and there's a very, very slight shifts every now and again. Or you can have enormous earthquakes when whole things rip apart very, very suddenly after massive forces have built up for a long time. I'd rather go for the very smooth, slippery uh, version of history. You know, what, what I think will probably happen if we vote leave with, um, say, 55% and people like Johnson and Gove don't just try to use it as a renegotiation ploy, is at Heathrow, on the signs when you come in, they, they, they paint out EU and they paint in EEA. And that's it. That's all that needs to happen. We just adopt the same status as Norway. 
on Iceland and the other EEA places. And that's it. We have the same trade tariffs, you know, lack of tariffs. We have the same kind of agreements as Norway. That would be easy. And the only thing we'd see as people is just coming into an airport. You wouldn't see EU passport holders. You'd see EEA passport holders. That's the way it could easily go. Obviously, the states will try to, uh, the state governments will try to make it much more painful than that. We've got Obama threatening 10 years before you can send a, uh, export an item to the United States, um, various other people threatening various things, but it's easy. We just changed to EEA status, hardly anything changes, except we are now independent, like Norway is, and instead of adopting 100% of EU rules, like Norway, we adopt 9% those we want to adopt, and we don't get hectored and lectured and bullied around by all the states, uh, the growing number of states in Eastern Europe. I think the EU is becoming a bit like the... Um, Eurovision Song Contest. I almost am old enough, well, I am old enough, to remember when good songs used to win that, like uh, like um, Dancing Queen from ABBA and so on, or, or whatever. No, it was a Waterloo, wasn't it? I just have Dancing Queen in my head. But now, of course, with the Eurovision Song Contest, we just get lots of dreadful songs winning because lots of cat countries that see themselves as being similar uh, gang up together and vote in what they want. The EU is going that way as well. People say, oh, we need to be inside the EU so we can we can have our say. We don't have any say anymore. There's 25 and there's going to be up to 30 countries in the EU. And there's one country, Britain. Uh, but what kind of power do you have in that kind of relationship? Much, much better to be outside the relationship. Um, the EU, uh, it will probably eventually suck in Turkey. It will probably bring in, I'm not sure if it's got the Ukraine in, but the Ukraine will come in. Uh, maybe even Iraq will come into the EU, and maybe even Syria will come into the EU. And then how much power will Britain have as a, a member of this club? Extremely, An extremely small amount of power. Much, much better to be off and independent. In some ways, I feel it's a bit like a, like a, like an unhappy marriage, maybe like Mr. Gove's marriage here. Um, so if some people are in a marriage, I think, should I get divorced? Well, I'm very, very unhappy. Um, but no, I'll stay with it because I like the status quo. And you know, a lot of people are in unhappy relationships because the thought of being alone and out there by themselves is too much for them. And they'd rather be unhappy and in a relationship which isn't doing anything for them, is making them miserable, but at least it is a relationship. And I think that's how a lot of people feel in the UK about uh, about the EU. Oh, you're absolutely right. As I said earlier, better the devil. You know, now you mentioned uh, the Eurovision Song Contest, and this was not on our list of talking points and already I can <laughs> I can smell the fear Andy I can smell the panic I can see people reaching for the toilet paper they're thinking this is something we hadn't considered before maybe now this will motivate us to get out and vote what would happen if we left the EU we wouldn't be able to relax everybody just relax as you were you no need for a change of underwear just yet because the UK um, if I remember rightly, joined the European Broadcasting Union. Now, it's a European Broadcasting Union. I think they joined in 1957. They are the overlords of the Eurovision Song Contest. And this is why you've got strange anomalies like Israel taking part in the Eurovision Song Contest. It's not an EU thing. So everybody just don't just calm down. You know, I can already see people rushing out of the pub, you know, and hopping into their car to drive home and tell their wife that they've got to <laughs> go and vote. Because, <laughs> you no, know, we can still take part in this horrendous uh, cultural car crash that is the um, the Eurovision Song Contest. Not a problem. Incidentally, today I did a quick survey of uh, um, bookmakers. Um, I don't know, I'm not sure what the equivalent of bookmaker is in the EU. What what are our French and German cousins? um, Oh, German would be Buchmacher. I suppose it would be, yeah. Uh, But anyway, people like Coral and William Hill. And uh, looking at the averages, it seems that currently... For uh, Remain seems to be about three to one. Uh, I'm guessing that's in favour for for the betting. And Leave is about five to two. Uh, I'm guessing that's kind of a get. Uh, but sixty percent of the voting, uh, sorry, the betting so far has been uh, on to uh, Remain, as it were. Now I only mention the bookmakers because quite often they can be a better uh, bellwether of trends than uh, pollsters can. <laughs> 
Very, very clever people, bookmakers. Um, we've seen in the Leicester City Tottenham fight for the Premier League, haven't we, how people have been cashing out their bets because very, very astute bookmakers have been saying, yes, you'll win £50,000 if Leicester win the Premier League, but I'm offering you £25,000 today to give up your bet. Um, so they're very, very clever people, bookmakers. And of course they have to be because they're having to lay off the odds all the time. So they, I believe in the market. I think the market is made up of 8 billion people making their own daily decisions with their own wealth and is a much, much better guide of, uh, of the future than, you know, a few elitist um, politicians sitting around, um, not smoky rooms anymore, but kind of, I don't know, green tea rooms these days, I should imagine, making decisions. So bookmakers have their finger on the pulse much more than than politicians do. Um, I think those odds are probably about right. But the Remain camp, much though it wants this to just uh, die as soon as they've won with 55%, it's not going away. If 45% of people in the UK uh, vote to leave, it's not going away, just like it hasn't gone away in Catalonia. Just like the Scottish independence vote didn't go away, even though the Scottish Independent Party uh, lost that election. They've let the genie out of the bottle and they cannot squeeze it back in. And when the EU, I think, because of monetary problems, suffers um, you know, all sorts of contusions over the next few years, um, this, this will rear its head again. And uh, it, hasn't, it won't go away. And I, I try to just uh, sit back and be a neutral observer in a way. I haven't voted, actually. I mean, I, I don't believe in democracy and uh, I haven't voted in an election for, I can't remember, it might be 15 years, but it's definitely 10 years. But I am going to vote in this one because I do believe uh, in secession. And uh, I do want to secede. I, I, want to, I want to see the whole thing break apart. But I want it to break apart smoothly and peacefully and calmly. And I don't want it to become uh, a prison which we have to break out of in any kind of... Uh, more aggressive way. Well, never mind the, the conventional arguments for leaving uh, the UK, leaving the EU. Maybe Nigel Nigel Farage should be coming out and and talking about not only the uh, the giant mosquitoes flying the ISIS, <laughs> the, the uh, ISIS flags, but he maybe should have been talking about uh, all the mung bean salad you could eat and green tea enemas from the EU. And uh, oh, dear. <laughs> that conjures up a, a violent image. <laughs> Well, it's the world we live in, Andy. That's just the way it is. But yeah, you mentioned your voting intentions. Uh, just as we draw things to a close for today, what, what's your uh, what sort of conversations you've been having in your personal life, family, friends, you know, colleagues, um, associates? Just you know, what what feeling have you been getting back uh, when you've been out there? I think I think stasis is is the name of the game. Um, you know, most people get up, go to work, come home. They like that. They can pay their mortgage. Uh, their children are in nice schools and are pleasant people. They were just I think people just dislike change. And I think voting to leave the EU is too much of a change for most people. They, Like you said earlier, most people have grown up with it. Most people don't know anything else. I mean, I am too old to remember, uh, you know, proper money, as older people call it, you know, 12 pennies in a shilling and so on. So I've grown up entirely with decimal money. And the thought of changing the money to maybe going back to 240 pence in a pound, I'd, I'd just be horrified. And I completely understand why younger people who've seen nothing else but the EU uh, will mostly be voting for the EU because that's just what they've grown up with. They've grown up with kilograms and uh, metres and how tall are you? I say to somebody, I'm expecting I'm six foot one and they say I'm one metre 82 and I, I've no idea what that means. I just can't imagine what that means. And again, most people don't think ideologically anymore. People used to. I mean, in Victorian times, you know, Gladstone and Disraeli would have these massive ideological debates with one another. And people would read them in Hansard and they'd read them in the newspapers. And individual people in just small houses in, you know, um, I'm from uh, I'm from Yorkshire, so from a village in Yorkshire. So people in villages in Yorkshire over fires would read Hansard and then... Th- think do i agree with disraeli or do i agree with gladstone people don't do that anymore it's all blipverts and uh instant messaging and what am i doing tomorrow or not even what am i doing tomorrow what am i doing today and people don't want to tomorrow to change so i think a lot of people will vote uh, with the remain but it's not going away i think um even though i'm in a in my uh, own household and, and with my group of friends I'm very much in a very tiny minority of one like I am on most things um, it's not going away I, I, I think that the genie is out of the bottle 
Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, last thought, absolutely last thought for the day. Uh, you mentioned secession earlier on and about certain trends are in place. And uh, one of the recurring themes in my shows when I'm talking about current affairs is global trends that are underway in economics, in um, energy and in the environment. Uh, setting, being apolitical about all those things for the purposes of this discussion, I just think that globalization, as much as it's been touted as like an uh, inevitable thing, I think that the smaller unit, I mean, whether we're talking about Iceland or Norway or Switzerland, the smaller unit with more control uh, into which people organizations, whatever it happens to be, they gravitate towards what suits them, you know, a smaller, more defined rule set, whatever, or no rules at all, whatever it happens to be, those sorts of things. And then all cooperating between each, between each other on a voluntary basis. This just seems to work better. And I think that is where the, the, the overall trends are. It, the road to, to there, I don't think, uh, it was not, doesn't really end anywhere. It's an ongoing situation. It's fluid. And it's not going to be pretty, I think, in many ways. But I just think that there are certain trends underway that the EU is flying in the face of. So this is not going away. And when this um, June referendum comes and goes, it's just a case of, well, what's the next tipping point going to be? What's the next crisis? You know, what's the next, you know, red flag that goes up? Well, again, we're not out of the two thousand. Sorry, I start that again. We're not out of the two thousand and seven crisis. We that has still to be resolved. It's been papered over with lots and lots of trillions of euros, trillions of dollars, hundreds of billions of pounds of paper money. But that's just um, injected more heroin into, into the heroin addict. The heroin addict still hasn't recovered from the heroin and still hasn't gone cold turkey yet. When the heroin addict, i.e. the EU, goes cold turkey, then we'll really, really see something. I think the 20th century was the age of the age of socialism, the age of the big block the Soviet bloc, um, the Warsaw Pact, uh, and all the other big blocs. The EU is, is is following that kind of socialist trend with kind of inertial momentum. But we're seeing the rise of, you know, smaller places, aren't we? We're seeing the rise of Singapore. We're seeing the rise of Hong Kong. We're seeing, we're seeing the rise of um, Asian nations. We're, we're seeing the rise of all sorts of individuals. Now, I, I don't deal with... A man. I don't deal with a Hong Kong person when I deal when I write a contract with somebody in Hong Kong. I'm dealing with my friend in Hong Kong who I'm doing a contract with, and I think a lot of people are like that. I think a lot of people fly around the world these days, and the the, the biggest hassle is going through the state lines where they want to stamp their tax cattle and in and out. Um, you fly within your own country, you don't get that hassle. When you fly outside your country that you that you hold a passport to and you get that hassle. And people are increasingly becoming, I think, independent and they're becoming individuals. I think the 20th century is the age of the socialism and the socialist bloc. I think the 21st century will be the century of the individual. Andy, I think this is the sixth time that you've been on with me and I keep asking you to tell people about your website and you keep telling me you don't have one. So, But I know you're working on at least one project, so share anything you'd like to with listeners before we wind it up for today. Well, I'm, I'm trying to get into financial technology at the moment and I've developed a, a web app. It's very, very experimental at the moment, so it's it's it, I'm, it's got all sorts of flaws and so on, but it will be ready soon. But if people want to have a quick look at it, it's uh, finlingoanalystapp.com. That's F-I-N-L-I-N-G-O Analyst App, finlingoanalystapp.com. That will take you to a, um, a website I'm developing, and that will be of particular use to anyone who's studying the CFA exam or anything like that, any kind of financial analysis exams. It generates, this site generates an infinite number of questions. It generates some... Um, uh, kind of multitude of, of different topics across financial areas to really, really test your knowledge. It's, it's a bit like Duolingo, I suppose, only for financial knowledge. So if you really want to pick up some financial knowledge where you can really, really do well in something like the CFA Level 1, Chartered Financial Analyst Level 1 exam, uh, then do go to finlingoanalystapp.com. We're developing, um, with a friend of mine, we're developing a site called finlingo.com and that should be going live soon and that will be the main portal. And on that portal of finlingo.com, which isn't ready yet, but will be soon, we'll have all sorts of how to make financial knowledge easy to acquire. Um, this A link through to this site where we help people pass the CFA Level 1 exam. 
and uh, and lots of other uh, financial stuff where we just basically we we make people fluent in finance. Splendid. Okay. Well, uh, now that we've wrapped that up, I'm not going to be needing this government leaflet anymore. So let me just. <laughs> There you go. Nine million quid down the drain. So, fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us today once again on LegalizeFreedom.com. My pleasure. Lovely speaking with you again, Greg. Well, folks, that's it for another week. As ever, thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed the show, check out the website, which is LegalizeFreedom.com. That's Legalize-Freedom.com, where you'll find an archive of programs offering alternative views on a wide range of topics, including politics and economics, energy and environment, culture, spirituality, history, and the nature of reality. You can also browse and buy a range of publications from our guests, and if you're feeling generous, make a donation to help keep the site up and running. Whether you listen, donate, or do both, I greatly appreciate your support. Until next time, I'm Greg Moffat, and you've been listening to LegalizeFreedom.com.